on This Week in Enterprise Tech, it's a legal extravaganza, part two. Twine on the set. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Enterprise Tech is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Twyatt. This Week in Enterprise Tech, recorded November 21st, 2014, or December 1st, 2014. Legal extravaganza number two. This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by TechServe, the world's largest independent Apple retailer and professional services provider. Go to techserve.com slash twyatt-7sins to get access to the free ebook on the seven deadly sins of iPad deployment. And by Braintree. If you're a developer or manager of a mobile app and searching for the right payments API, check out Braintree. Braintree's new V0 SDK makes it easy to support multiple mobile payment types with one simple integration. To learn more and to try out their sandbox, go to braintreepayments.com slash twit. And by PagerDuty. PagerDuty decreases alerting noise for IT operations and developers to ensure that the right engineers are notified at the right time. Increase your uptime and sign up for a 14-day free trial at pagerduty.com slash twit. Welcome to Twyatt This Week in Enterprise Tech. It's the show dedicated to the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and the geek who just wants to know how the world is connected. I'm your host, Father Robert Palliser, the digital Jesuit, your guide to all things in the enterprise. But I'm not alone in guiding you. I'm joined by my fantastic co-host, starting with the currently frozen in time, Mr. Brian Chi, the director of the Advanced Network Computing Laboratory in Honolulu, Hawaii, who on his frozen video is looking rather pensive today. Brian, what are you thinking about? I'm thinking about all the insane amount of work I'm going to need to do. Uh, we are finally going to start diving in and trying to fix our multi-million dollar ROV. And if we can succeed, we'll be able to go service the underwater observatory more often. Fantastic. And a co-host who's not currently frozen in carbonite, Mr. Curtis Franklin the from Information Week Radio. It's good to see you, sir, in motion video. Thank you. It is uh, delightful to be here when uh, when we are, in fact, unfrozen. Florida has finally emerged from the polar vortex, and we're back into normal Florida weather, which makes everyone happy. Uh, one host frozen and the other host unfreezing. Go figure. Well, gentlemen, let's jump right into the blips. It's going to be an interesting show today because we've got a legal extravaganza coming. But before that, I want to talk a little bit about Amazon going all in on green power. Now, Amazon is joining Apple, Google, and Facebook in the pledge to move their massive online presence to 100% renewable energy. In a post on the Amazon Web Services page, Amazon announced that it will achieve a 100% renewable energy footprint at some time in the future, though it declined to provide a roadmap or timeline. Though these greening announcements are welcome, many point to the lack of transparency in tech companies' reporting of power usage and the grandiose claims that are almost impossible to verify. BitTorrent goes enterprise. BitTorrent usually comes up in enterprise conversations as app number one on the banned list, but a new pro version of BitTorrent Sync is designed to put the company squarely into the enterprise toolkit. The hook? BitTorrent Sync offers device-to-device -device syncing that doesn't involve a cloud provider or third-party servers of any sort. In the pro version, BitTorrent brings us a better user interface and snappier performance to the party, along with syncing between Mac, Windows, Android, and iOS devices. Will this be enough to take BitTorrent off the naughty list? For companies looking to keep mobile users securely synced, it might just do the trick. Well, in this case... Have I got a deal for you? Buy a Chromebook, get one terabyte of Google Drive storage for free. The Chromebook and Chromebox platforms are fascinating doodads and seem to fit nicely for some and not for others. However, the biggest complaint is that they normally suffer from not having enough storage for us electronic pack rats. So now Google is stepping up by offering one terabyte of storage free for two years if you buy a Chrome device by January 1st, 2015. A great deal unless you're in higher education where Google is already rolling out unlimited storage for Google University accounts. 
Well, in a shocking turn of events, Utah is planning to water hoard the NSA. Legislature, legislators in Utah are considering a bill that would protect N, a pro, a protest NSA surveillance by turning off their water. The bill, HB 161, would refuse support to any federal agency which collects electronic data within the state. The turnaround would be ironic for the NSA data center, which chose Utah for its 1 million square foot data center in order to take advantage of its cheap power and plentiful water. The bill will almost certainly be killed before passing, but it's an interesting opportunity for Utah to, as State Representative Roger Barris puts it, not subsidize what the NSA is doing on the backs of our citizens. On to email, it's verse then inbox. Early adopters have been scrambling to find invitations to Inbox, Google's new app and platform for living, living a more productive life in email. While the mad dash has been underway, IBM has somewhat more quietly released Verse, its cloud-based platform for better email control. Verse combines email, meeting, calendar, file sharing, instant messaging, social update, and video chat capabilities in a single environment that's currently available as a freemium offering in the IBM cloud. Those in the know think that an on-premises version is inevitable, as is a version that brings IBM Notes capabilities under the Verse umbrella. Verse is aimed squarely at the enterprise. It's going to be very interesting to watch the market to see if that emphasis is enough to overcome Google's consumer-based might. Well, with all these new things showing up on the Internet, this comes from the Independent in the UK. A breakthrough fiber optic tech can transfer the entire Internet in a single glass strand. While a bit blown out of context, this new optical fiber technology combines seven optical cores into a strand of glass about the size of a human hair. Traditional optical fiber has but a single core of pure glass to transmit light signals, but by putting seven cores into a single strand, you could optically multiplex over those seven cores to not just multiply the amount of data sent by seven, but exponentially raise it to the power of seven. The researchers in the U.S. and Netherlands are claiming 253 terabits per second as an estimated transmission rate possible with this new glass. Uh, we don't usually cover luxury cruising ships on Twyet, but we're making an exception to talk about the Royal Caribbean's Quantum of the Seas because the onboard IT rivals that of many SMBs. Touted as a smart ship, the Quantum of the Seas includes satellite-driven Wi-Fi that can deliver a total of 600 megabits per second at a time that most cruise ships struggle to deliver dial-up speeds. In addition, passengers, their baggage, and even their phones can be tracked throughout the ship to automatically give them access to ship services, pay for items, and direct them to events or muster stations. Two red Epic cameras on the bridge of the ship transmit 5K video to 80-inch 4K displays through the onboard IP voice video system so passengers inside cabins can have a virtual balcony to see what the captain sees throughout the voyage. And of course... What high-tech cruise ship would be complete without a robotic bartender? That's uh, definitely one ship that I want to jump into. Now, when we come back, we're going to kick off our legal extravaganza. That's right. It's a crossover between Twyet and This Week in Law. It's uh, going to get legal. But before that, let's go ahead and talk about the first sponsor of this episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and it's TechSerp. Now, we all know that the iPad has made a big splash. It's not just BYOD anymore. It's a force multiplier. Businesses keep coming up with creative ways to service their customers, to increase productivity among employees, and make more money with the same resources all by using that force multiplier, all by using that iPad. For example, the Institute of Culinary Education equipped students, faculty, and chefs with the iPad, empowering them to do away with heavy and unwieldy textbooks and streamlining the learning process. A major cable services provider in the Northeast gave its field technicians, who, if you think about it, are the public face of the company, iPads that have been configured to provide better customer service. Uh, may, uh, and, just, uh, and retail companies have enhanced their in-store customer experience by using the iPad, not just as a point-of-sale device, but also as a spot where customers can learn about sales, special offers, and upcoming events. These clients and more have turned to TechServe, the country's largest Apple reseller that sells, supports, and manages the largest iPad deployments in the world to manage their iPad projects. Now, if you're considering adding iPads to your business, why not ensure the project's success with an experienced partner? You owe it to yourself. TechServe assists businesses of all sizes to deploy Apple solutions, as well as solutions from Avid, Adobe, and more throughout the United States. No matter if you've started deploying iPads already or are just 
getting started. TechServe can help. And right now, TechServe is offering a complimentary download just for Twite listeners who are deploying iPads or who are interested in learning more about doing so. Go to TechServe.com slash Twite dash seven sins to get access to the seven deadly sins of iPad deployment and see the common pitfalls that throw companies for a loop during their iPad projects. Avoid their mistake. This complimentary download is available right now just for Twite listeners at T-E-K-S-E-R-V-E dot -E com slash Twite dash seven cents and we thank TechServe for their support of this week in enterprise tech we welcome back to the show it's been a couple of months since we've had denise howell and evan brown the hosts of this week in law here on the twit tv network uh, I, I, folks i am so happy to have you here because every once in a while we actually want to get some legal experts in to talk about all the legal stories that we cover in the enterprise so uh, welcome to the show Thank you, Padre. It's great to be back. Now, uh, I think we're just going to run through some of the stories that we've been touching in the last couple of episodes since the last legal extravaganza, because we want to get your opinion, your legal view on what these actually mean. The first one, we're going to take it from the blips. This, this HB 161 that uh, Utah legislators are looking at right now to deny the NSA water rights so that they wouldn't be able to run the data center anymore. First of all, I have to say, from the bottom of my heart, it brings a big chuckle to think that they're, you know, they're basically saying, oh, yeah, you can have your data center. We're just not going to give you any power or water, so have fun with that. Uh, uh, let me open up to you first, Denise. This, this uh, harkens back to my days of high school debate where you talked about federal versus state rights. This is a weird thing where you've got a federal agency that went through a, a really long process to choose its location and it has a right to be there but then you've got a state that also according to the state constitution has the right to allocate water and power and technically if they could pass the bill you would have a great conflict of states versus federal rights w what what is this it sounds like a supreme court case to me is what this is <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i i this is a toughie um Certainly, uh, the state does have the ability to allocate resources, but does it have the ability to, ability to tell the federal government it's not entitled to resources that a private business might be able to use? Uh, I, I, that one kind of blows my mind. So um, I, I really don't know what's going to happen with this. It's fascinating that Utah is taking this approach. It seems like maybe some, you know, some sort of savvy state legislative bargaining for federal accommodations and, uh, you know, other privileges, but uh, I really don't know. Yeah, it, it, it does definitely feel like someone's playing a political card here. Chiever, mm -hmm. let me throw it to you because uh, some, some people who may be watching this who have not ever created a mass, massive data center may not understand what's the significance of shutting off water. Uh, this is a 1 million square foot data center. We've talked about it quite a bit on, on Twiat about all the tech that goes into it. Why is it such a big deal if Utah decides to, to not not just shut off, but decrease the amount of water that uh, that the data center might get? Yeah, it's, it's simple. When you're trying to remove that much heat, you need to basically run water over the heat exchanges on the outside. So if they reduce the amount of water, you reduce the amount of cooling, and you reduce the amount of computers that NSA can actually run. Right, right. You know, Curtis, it's, you know, we understand why this has become controversial. I mean, when they started building this data center, nobody knew about anything, about NSA wiretapping, about uh, uh, how much invasion of privacy was, was going on. And it's become a little bit of a poison pill. Nobody wants to admit that their state is supporting the infrastructure that is being used to spy on Americans. Let's be honest. I mean, they say they don't, but they are. That is, do you see this, any sort of analog in the enterprise world? There's always that unsavory IT practice like tracking, like uh, reporting on customer trends that every business wants, but they don't necessarily want to be associated with. You know, there, there are some analogs, and, and some of them are, as you say, based on what a company is doing. Uh, for example, I don't think you would find very many large data centers uh, sited around the country that would go public 
with just how much of their business might be dependent on porn servers. Uh, <laughs> that's just not the sort of thing that most communities would be thrilled to have around. Uh, with that said, I think it's interesting the ground on which this battle is being fought because not just out west, all over the country, but particularly in the American West, water is politics. Uh, we've seen it in all kinds of different arenas, and it's being used here. Um, you know, it, we're, we're seeing water battles all over the states of Florida and Georgia uh, have a case going to, I believe, the Supreme Court over water right now. So you're seeing these, these things being dealt with more and more often. And it's not just the typical battles. How many jobs can you bring? How much tax revenue will you ultimately supply to state coffers? It really is getting to be over issues of content and the work type. And that's a new arena for most of commercial IT. Uh, Evan, I want to go over to you because Curtis brings up a very interesting point. He, he jokingly referred to, you know, getting rid of data centers full of porn. But that's actually a real concern. This, this seems to be a bill that was pushed as a snowball's chance of hell of actually making it through. But the, the logic is sound, which is, does a state have the right to say, we don't want that in our state? I mean, if you're going to run a data center that does gambling, that does porn, that does anything we object to, we have the right to cut off your power or your utilities because we control the utilities. It, it, and then suddenly it becomes more than just about spying. It becomes about, well, how, how, can you, how can you regulate what goes on the servers that might be located within your legal jurisdiction? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think it's pretty easy to make this much more complicated than what it's ever going to be in reality. Look, nothing's going to happen here. This bill is probably not going to pass. Even if it did, I think it, Utah's policy of trying to do what it's doing or doing what it's trying to do here would not go very far at all. Um, because what, what we have here is a situation where you've got the federal government um, allocating space, having acquired space in whatever way it did to put this data center here. And, and Utah is not going to be able to, to cut off the, the water supply in this particular situation. It wouldn't matter if it was for, um, uh, I mean, well, with the federal government, it's going to be much harder for, to cut off the water supply than if it were private enterprise, you know, a porn company opening up a data center there or a, opening a casino or what have you, online gambling data center or, wh or what have you here. With the federal government, you know, you've got to remember that that there's the there's the spheres of, of federal and state influence and the constitution sort of strikes the balance between those things here and there's this idea that comes from uh, all the way back in the early part of the 20th century called the winters doctrine that allows the the federal government to to reserve certain amounts of water it's implied that the federal government is setting aside certain amounts of water when it's going to allocate land to do something this came out of the idea of indian reservations and it's been up, extended to military bases and, and and things like that so i mean it's crazy to think that Utah has the power to to cut off the water here. And I, I don't read the bill as even saying that that's what it's going to do anyway. It says it's just going to not lend support to the, the provision of water. If the federal government really wants to have water in that place, it will get water to that place, whether it be through the application of this the Winters Doctrine or if it, by eminent domain. I mean, this is a, this is an issue that affects interstate commerce. So the, the federal government would be perfectly within its rights to run a pipe from whatever rivers close by running up from the Colorado River, where where have you, to this data center. There's not going to be anything that the state of Utah can do. This is all just um, stuff that's that, that's clearly political, and uh, it takes us off on a bunch of primrose paths to to talk about things that really will never be of any, any consequence in the situation. Yeah, it really does sound like posturing. I mean, you got to remember that Orrin Hatch was the state senator who, who really, he lobbied. In fact, they call this a win for Utah because they're getting a lot of cash from the federal government to have this one million square foot data center in their state. Orrin Hatch, of course, sat on the uh, Intelligence Committee for 15 years. So it's kind of strange to be taking the money with one hand and trying to take away the water with the other. You, you can't really do that. Let's go ahead and jump into a story that we covered a couple of weeks back. I'm sure that you covered it on, on Twill. And it's about the Silk Road technicality that uh, we were afraid the entire cloud could fall into. Now, this was uh, pertaining to the defense for Ross Ulbricht, who was accused of being the dread pirate Roberts who masterminded Silk Road. 
Now, they challenged the defense, challenged the legitimacy of the evidence against their client because they claimed that all of the evidence in the case was gathered from an illegal search of a server that Ulbricht had rented in Rejavac. Now, if that search was ruled illegal, then it would have poisoned the entire evidence tree against Ulbricht. The FBI claimed that they found Silk Road not by an illegal physical search, but by doing a malformed data attack on Silk Road's login screen until it returned a real IP address. And of course, once they had the real IP address, they were able to get a warrant for that particular location. Now, uh, uh, again, we talked about this at length, but I want to bring in some legal experts. Uh, let me start with you first, Denise. We, you know, we were mulling about the legality of even the FBI's defense to say that well, we, we didn't, we didn't uh, uh, you know, just find the server. We, we used a malformed packet attack until it returned its actual address, so we were able to get a warrant for its location. But that still sounds like hacking. It still sounds like uh, illegal computer access. Uh, did you cover this at all on, on Twill? I, I know that we've talked about it. I don't think we got into that specific uh, question of, you know, what crosses the line uh, between... Um, taking advantage of a security deficiency and hacking. And uh, I think that's really where where that would turn is, you know, if it's go going to be illegal for a third party private citizen to do it, then it's going to be um, not kosher for the government to do it too. And uh, yeah, I just don't know enough about how they tried to, you know, what process they went through um, to get the real IP address uh, to be able to answer that question. Yeah. Uh, of course, I mean, that's that's the principle, right? I mean, if it's illegal for a private citizen, it should be illegal for the government to do it, Wh which mm -hmm. which is strange because the FBI is not even asserting that. I mean, they they actually, they actually have several outstanding cases right now where people who have used malformed packet attacks are being indicted, and then they admitted to using a malformed packet attack, which I think that that's mm -hmm. what blew away a lot of people. But there was another, there's another part here, Denise, and I, I want to keep you on on this. Judge sure. Forrest, who was the judge who was presiding over the case, she essentially went with the FBI. She said, look, all the complaints against the FBI are moot because Ulbricht never claimed ownership of the information that the FBI accessed. And people were looking at this saying this was kind of a catch-22. I mean, if he had if he had asserted ownership of that information, then he would have essentially said, yes, I'm guilty. But if he doesn't assert information, then the FBI doesn't have to follow the law on illegal warrants and wiretaps. Yeah, I mean, it was clever of the judge. And it's it's a situation I, you've, you've teed it up as, you know, is this really a threat to cloud storage? The question is, Ulbricht would not have had to establish ownership over the information on the server uh, or or acknowledge what information that was but you know he would have had to um, acknowledge that yes this is my server and you're not uh, able to search what's on it without a warrant um, so you know I get where the judge is coming from that you can you your right of privacy does not necessarily extend to a right to protect where your the data is stored when your your information is relevant in a lawsuit or prosecution. Right. So I, I could, I, I think I see where the judge was going here and how she reached this conclusion. Achiever, we, uh, we actually ran into this when we were talking about uh, Mega Upload and uh, Kim.com, the idea of ownership. And back then the DOJ claimed that they could claim the servers because they weren't claiming the, I mean, because they weren't claiming the information that was on the servers. They were claiming the physical boxes. And the, uh, that was sort of like the start, the genesis, at least in Twiat, of this idea of, well, how do you claim ownership of information that may be spread across a box you've never seen before? Uh, we've, I mean, we've run into this, right? I mean, that's, isn't that the, the big issue for the cloud, which is you never know where your information is being stored. That's the whole idea. It, it's stored everywhere. Oh, yeah. And uh, a lot of the cloud vendors, it's a point of pride. Your data is duplicated around the globe so that no single data center loss will cause you to lose your critical data. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, in fact, a lot of researchers say that if, um, you know, we, we won't use cloud because we, there's no guarantee our data is actually going to stay in the United States. And once it leaves the, our shores, we start getting into some real issues with our uh, publication rights. Right, right. Uh, Curtis, let me jump over to you and get the enterprise side on this. 
Uh, because if you remember from a couple of weeks ago, when we talked about this hole that the cloud could fall into, the issue for us was claiming ownership of something that might be virtual, that might be stored across multiple servers, might be, might be stored across multiple legal jurisdictions. We question the, the, the wisdom of any enterprise that would choose to store anything off premise. Because if it's on premise, if you own the server, if you own the box, if you own the data center, you can make an absolute assertion that this is mine and you must get a warrant for it. But the second you put it into the cloud, it seems that you would forfeit that right. Uh, have, you, have you talked to any about that at all on uh, Information Week Radio? You know, it's interesting because this week we were running a uh, course in the Information Week University with uh, a gentleman who is the CIO of the city of Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, the class was on cloud management, and, and this did come up. Uh, it's something that we've talked about before. It seems like from the enterprise standpoint, the regulations and, and the laws are, are pretty clear when it comes to ownership of a physical server. And we have a fair amount of law and regulation in place when it comes to data in transit. Uh, but data, just, just data sitting somewhere uh, is something that, that is much less clearly defined in terms of the way the regulations and the laws deal with it. And so from that standpoint, you're absolutely right. What we don't have right now is, is a clear ownership framework for data that sits somewhere on servers that are owned by someone else. And, and let's remember that in not a few of these cases, the provider you contract with might or might not own the servers that the data is sitting on. You know, they may themselves contract with a provider. I'm thinking about all of the cloud service providers who buy space and processing time, for example, on AWS uh, or S3. You know, th there's a lot of that going on. So it really is an issue, and it's really something that enterprise consumers have to take into account and pay serious attention to when it comes to any information, any data that could possibly fall under any regulatory scheme, which basically means for any but the most trivial data, you need to know exactly where it's sitting and you're much better off if you are the owner of that box. Evan, uh, let me throw that to you because that, that, to me, that's fascinating. The idea that if we own the box and we physically have the box on premise, there's no question about possession. There's no question about what's required by the law. You have to get a warrant for my box. We actually do have a pretty good idea of the protections that should be provided to data that is in transit. I mean, we don't always follow it, but we, we, we understand that there's a reasonable expectation that when data is going from point A to point B, it should be protected. I think Curtis is absolutely right in that we seem to be falling into the zone where we don't really have a way for the law to address data that may be on a box or multiple boxes that I don't own in locations that I don't own uh, in formats that I have no control over. Uh, what, what do you see in the law that's trying to catch up with that? I don't, I'm not so sure there's anything that's I, I'm, I'm not sure there's there's as much of a problem here, Padre, as what you're trying to tee it up as. First of all, I don't think that the enterprise 99% of the time should be all that worried about the Fourth Amendment and whether its Fourth Amendment rights are going to be violated because the real privacy and data protection issues that the enterprise needs to think about are just those things that fall under uh, the nature of breach of contract or uh, what if you know there's unauthorized access to the data by someone in the data center or a hacker or, or what have you. It's not whether the government's going to come. Unless you're Kim.com, most business people are not Kim.com. Let's, let's take that as a given. So, I mean, the real concern to the enterprise with privacy and where data may reside seems to be other things rather than the Fourth Amendment. And if we're talking about this in the context of a Fourth Amendment case, I just want to make that that clarification. Another thing uh, is where I think we, we we may be going a little bit askew on our thinking here is characterizing it as being related or tied in some important way to the ownership of the data or ownership of the of the box or what have you. And I don't think that that's uh, what the judge here in the Ross Ulbricht case was uh, concerned about, whether or not he owned 
that server or owned the information on it. All it was, the, 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 where the Fourth Amendment analysis rose and it fell was on this issue of whether he had a personal privacy interest in that. And the question, and the, the judge actually used this language, you know, she said that if he had signed a declaration that talked about if he had leased space on the server mm -hmm. or had mm. some control or dominion over it, there's no, there, you don't see anything in, in the judge's opinion about ownership being the, the sine qua non of the Fourth Amendment uh, protection here. So, and for the same reason, I don't think that we should get upset uh, about that in any other context, whether we're talking about the enterprise's Fourth Amendment concern or the enterprise's uh, general concerns about liability for having its data on a data center sitting somewhere in the United States, sitting somewhere in Europe, sitting somewhere in, in Asia or what have you. It's all the, uh, what what matters is the, uh, you know, the, the, the right and ability to claim uh, some kind of control or dominion o o over that. I'm reminded of the federal rules of civil procedure that talk about the production of documents and discovery. And the language there is possession, custody, or control. So that is what triggers a legal obligation for somebody to turn over documents in litigation. I think the same framework for thinking about one's legal rights to data and the protections that would come from uh, the Fourth Amendment or the obligations that may arise uh, from having that data under uh, whatever legal framework you're talking about would be sort of like, you know, either you possess it or it's in your custody, which may or may not be really in your possession. But more importantly, you know, whether it's in your control, whether you have the legal right and the obligation to be the one to direct whether that whether that data is there and whether it's deleted or, or, or whatever becomes of it. OK, I, I get that. I understand what you're saying. But then I think of something like, for example, the, the case in South Carolina with the woman who was able to sex successfully argue uh, in, in a case that uh, in which she gained access to the email of her husband and was able to prove that he was having an affair. Uh, the, the state Supreme Court agreed with her, saying that the emails were abandoned because they had been looked at but left on the server for more than 60 days. And I, I look at a decision like that and I say, well, okay, well, it, is that something the enterprise has to worry about? If you've got states that are saying essentially you can abandon data even if it is still in a in a construct a, a gmail service that you claim ownership over then i have to start rethinking about putting my data anywhere where it could be accessed without my consent it's a pretty narrow scope of of, of situations that fall under that six month thing that's a provision in the stored communications act that talks about when the government can rightfully access stored communications and as differentiated from information you know metadata ab about the communication so it's a, pr it's a pretty limited set of circumstances i mean ordinary uh data on a server sitting somewhere uh whether it's subject to um being turned over to the government uh, is not going to depend on whether ordinarily, unless it's you know in, subject to this specific thing in the, in the Stored Communications Act. Ordinarily, that's not going to depend on how long it's how long it's been there. Um, I think that the the protections, if any, sitting uh, to, that would uh, apply to the quote unquote owner <laughs> of the data <laughs> somewhere uh, else would 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 be independent of, of of that period of time. So, you know, that I, I see where you're coming from with that that South Carolina case, but that's a that was a pretty narrow uh, a pretty specific situation there that had to deal with uh, the Stored Communications Act, which incidentally gives quite a bit of protection to the privacy of emails versus uh, a lesser uh, application of, of privacy interests to the metadata about, right. uh, about those communications. Right. We'll be right back. But first, let's go ahead and take a pause for our sponsor, Braintree. This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by Braintree. It's code for easy online payments. If you're a developer or product manager searching for the right mobile payments API, check out Braintree. Their V0 SDK makes it easy to accept multiple mobile payment types in less than 10 minutes with one 10-line snippet of code. Braintree supports all payment types your customers might want to use, including Apple Pay, PayPal, Bitcoin, Venmo, all major credit cards and debit cards, plus 130 global currencies. If you're a developer, then you're going to wonder how you did without their V0 SDK. The code supports Android, iOS, and JavaScript clients. SDKs in seven different languages, including .NET, Node.js, Java, Perl, PHP, Python, and Ruby. It's elegant code with clear documentation. Only 10 lines of in-app code and you're ready to run. Oh, Braintree has the best in-class customer service. If you have a question or problem, with Braintree, you'll always get a live person to talk to. And if you're struggling, Braintree will actually handle the integration for you and walk you through the process. 
Of course, Braintree knows that it's not enough to have easy-to-integrate code and top-notch customer service. They get that they're offering you financial services and that their security is your security. That's why they use tokens to secure payment data so credit card information is never passed on to merchant servers. They're known for their back-end security and merchant protection. Braintree has you covered. Braintree is the fastest, easiest, and most secure way to accept payments, period. Now, it's no surprise that Braintree is the payments API used by companies like Uber, Airbnb, Hotel Tonight, Living Social, and GitHub. They've made the payment experience in these apps seamless and magical, and now you can have that same magic in your app. Braintree scaled with these companies from early stage startups to the successful companies that they are today. So you know that they can scale with your business too, from processing your first dollar to your billionth. No matter how a customer would like to pay, they can pay with Braintree. Uh, if you're searching for the right payments platform, check out the Braintree V0 SDK today at braintreepayments.com slash twit. Review their documentation. It's simple and concise. Play around in their sandbox. Give Braintree a try with no commitment and test your integration before going into production. After you integrate Braintree, the first $50,000 in transactions are fee-free. That's braintreepayments.com slash twit. braintreepayments.com slash twit. And we thank Braintree for their support of this week in enterprise tech. Uh, now, this next story, I, I do want to give over to our tool folk because I believe you you just tackled it, and it's all <laughs> about net neutrality. Mark Cuban, fun with FOIA. Can you tell me a little bit about the legal developments behind net neutrality? We've been talking a lot about the politics. Now tell me about the law. Oh, wow. So, I mean, you just opened a subject that we could talk about for the next, you know, 18 Year. hours and <laughs> still be going. We we did a few, you have some links to um, some stories that we just talked about on uh, Twill earlier today. Uh, and um, they're really kind of non-development stories because really nothing is going on on the net neutrality front right now, except for we're waiting for the FCC to let us know what its new open internet rule is going to consist of. It has had that rule, um, uh, the proposed rule published and has had lots of public comment on it and is now sort of sitting with that and is going to decide um, how it's going to proceed and what net neutrality is going to look like in the future. Uh, the stories we highlighted on Twitter are just kind of, it, it's funny, the folks over at The Verge seem to be um, having some fun with net neutrality in the absence of any uh, real developments this week on it. Um, Addie Robertson over there did a really funny story on uh, picking up on a couple of tweets from Mark Cuban, um, taking the line that seems to be taking the line that net neutrality would be over-regulating in a way that um, Ayn Rand decried in some of her literature. And uh, she, she uh, cobbled together an Atlas Unplugged where she um, cast different people in, in fictional uh, roles, including Comcast as the, you know, obviously the bad guy corporation. And um, it's, it's a pretty funny read. Uh, but the, the underlying theme of it is, you know, are you, are you thinking of the FCC and its new open internet rule as, you know, big government coming in and, and really reining in uh, the captains of industry and preventing them from being able to get things done. And I think that net neutrality is, is way too complicated and nuanced a topic to really slot into a box like that. Um, certainly there are people that would take that position and say, yes, you know, you have to do a total hands off and let uh, the, the deals fall where they may and in the absence of a legitimate monopoly that um, the Justice Department steps in and breaks up, there's, there's really no um, reason or authority for the FCC to um, come in and regulate here. Uh, it's, it's not that simple of a question, I think. Um, yeah. the, there's, there's a lot that the FCC can do and what it's trying to figure out now, I think it'll be interesting to see if it decides to reclassify broadband um, to uh, Title II, which uh, will go ahead and treat uh, broadband 
providers as a utility. Lots of people um, have lots of opinions why that might not be a good thing, and others have opinions about why it might be a good thing, uh, but there's no guarantee that that's even going to happen. So we're really in a wait and see mode as to what the FCC is going to do. The other um, kind of funny thing we throw in, threw into the show was um, uh, The Verge, again, I think just uh, to give themselves something fun to write about, did a Freedom of Information Act request to the FCC to see um, staffer emails in response to John Oliver's net neutrality <laughs> sketch. His rant, and yeah. they, it, it, they are pretty funny to read. The, you know, the staffers were getting quite a hoot out of the um, John Oliver coverage. Uh, the substantive thing that we talked about um, had to do with U.S. Telecom uh, asking the FCC to consider the report of a couple of economists that if they do reclassify broadband services so that they can be more um, thoroughly or um, uh, regulated in a different way and, and, and in a more intrusive way than the FCC now can, uh, that uh, the, these economists have concluded that investment in broadband will fall uh, precipitously, that telecom providers will lose tens of billions of dollars worth of investments, um, which, you know, may be kind of a sky is falling prognostication, may be a legitimate concern. Uh, these seem to be respected economists making this claim or, or you know, maybe something would happen that nobody's really anticipating that the, the market would shake out differently. So, um, again, still net neutrality is still out there as something <laughs> to keep a close eye on, but uh, we're, we're really in wait and see mode. Yeah. Uh, Evan, I want to ask you some practical pr uh, questions here because we've, we've been talking about net, net neutrality, it seems like since the beginning of, of this week in enterprise tech, at least in, here on the Twit TV network. But let's say the FCC decided to go with some sort of reclassification, either a complete reclassification under Title II or that hybrid reclassification that uh, that, that Chairman Tom Wheeler was, was discussing. What's the process? I mean, what would they have to do in order to make this happen? Is it just a decision that they make? Does it have to go through Congress? Take, take me through the legal procedure for any sort of Title II uh, in, in, invocation. I don't know. I honestly don't know. I would have to ask a communications lawyer on that because it's a pretty Byzantine process. And I know that, uh, you know, there there has been this rulemaking process that's gone along so far. But as far as the rollout and the implementation of that goes, um, I don't know. I don't know how that would go. I know that it would be subject to review. What is it, Denise? It would be the Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia, right? It's not the federal circuit, right? Do you I, know that's Denise right. Where? It's the, the D.C. circuit. Why yes. is that? Wait, so why is it the D.C. circuit and not the federal court? Well, it is uh, the federal court. Well, they're both court. federal right. courts. Yeah, yeah. it is. It, uh, there's there's the, different the, circuits. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Denise. The, the federal circuit uh, does um, patent law and, and that sort of thing. The D.C. circuit is just the, the standard uh, federal uh, appellate okay. court in that jurisdiction. Right. Yeah. So it's, it is sort of a court that's, I mean, it's sort of unique, um, but yeah. because it's, and it's often confused with the federal circuit, but it's the, yeah. So, um, and so I, you know, I, I, I just confess, I don't know exactly how it would work out and I know it's a, it's a complex process, but I do know that there, there, anything like that is, is almost inevitable to get that review. So that's how it would make its way into the court system. And if the, and if the Supreme court ultimately were to, to weigh in, it would be on this interest that is presented in the, in the case, uh, as to, you know, like whether the, the FCC acted arbitrarily and capriciously in, in, in reclassifying in the way that it did. So there are plenty of, of avenues for it to, to be reviewed and make sure that it would pass muster under even a constitutional uh, thing. So. Yeah. All right. Well, let's go ahead and move on to the next story because uh, I know uh, we've got a hard out for Evan here in about uh, uh, 15 or so minutes. Uh, there, there is one story that I want to tackle before the break. We covered this on Twight about a month ago, and this was... Um, sort of a good news, bad news thing. It was Marriott being fined $600,000 for deauthorizing guests. Now, between 2012 and 2014, the Gaylord Opryland Hotel and Convention Center in Nashville, Tennessee, used deauthorization attacks, that's a Wi-Fi technique to knock people off of a Wi-Fi network, to attack guests who were using wireless hotspots, their own wireless hotspots, especially with the, within the boots of the convention center. Now, the reason why they would do this is because 
they would offer house wireless for between $250 to $1,000 for the course of a convention. Now, they also said that they were doing it for management purposes. And, and actually, Chiebert and I and Curtis all have experience of this. When you turn on a hotspot inside of a convention center, all you're doing is adding to the noise floor. But the FCC decided that Marriott was in violation of Section 333 of the Communications Act, which states... And I quote, no person shall willfully or maliciously interfere with or cause interference to any radio communication of any station licensed or authorized by or under this chapter or operated by the United States government. Now, Chiebert, uh, I, I forget which side you're on, but um, yes, if they were doing this just to make people buy connections, that is definitely a D-bag move. However, there is a valid management complaint here, right? Because if you turn on your hotspot, you kill Wi-Fi for everybody. Well, first off, I do want to point out one thing. Wi-Fi is in an unlicensed band. Mm -hmm. And I believe that does make a little difference. Also, I want to point out that the rental agreement for convention centers almost always include a clause on managing the network and only authorized um, communications device, internet devices. So for someone to rent a booth in a major convention center, they have already agreed to, in, in theory, not run anything that's going to interfere with the convention center facilities. So I don't think we've heard the last of this. Um, now, keep in mind, especially in the 2.4 gigahertz range, there's really only three non-overlapping channels, you know, 1, 6, and 11. Um, and most personal hotspots are in the 2.4 gigahertz range. So what we're doing, what Marriott's doing is protecting their infrastructure because they have a service level agreement to provide Wi-Fi to their customers, whereas the booth managers are just trying to you know, in my mind, get out of paying for a fee. And your numbers are actually a little low. 250 to to $1,000 is for teeny tiny convention centers. For large convention centers and large conventions, uh, internet connections, a uh, 100 meg internet connection can go up to $5,000 for a show. Right, right. Uh, Curtis, let me, let me get you in on here because you've also experienced this. Uh, First of all, I never turn on my hotspot when I'm at a convention center because it's not going to work. It's I'm going to be using a cell system that's overloaded with a Wi-Fi system that's overloaded. And typically what the more advanced users will do is we'll just use uh, eight or, uh, 5 gigahertz wireless because that tends to work much better. But uh, you've, you've heard people say, look, we just shut down 2.4 gigahertz, right? Uh, and I, I actually had a conversation after our episode with one of the IT people for Marriott who anonymously said, look, this really was an IT management thing. And if the FCC is going to come in and tell us how we can and cannot manage our network, well, we just don't know what we're going to do. It, isn't that a, a valid concern? Well, it's, it's, it might be valid. And I think what the FCC would say is that Marriott needs to find a different mechanism for dealing with its valid concern because you know looking at that the the statute that the, they point out to it doesn't say just licensed it says licensed or authorized and these hotspots are authorized uses within the unlicensed 2.4 gig band mm -hmm. um, the fcc has proven itself to be pretty darned unyielding over the years in the u.s with some very, very specific exceptions, almost always for for government, uh, specifically military uses, you can't jam a radio signal. We just don't allow it. Uh, whether we're talking about in the Wi-Fi situations in a convention hall or the handful of people who have uh, tried, for example, jamming cell phone signals in movie theaters. It simply isn't allowed. I don't think the FCC is trying to rule on the legitimacy of Marriott's concern. What they're saying is if they chose an unlawful way to address that concern. So Marriott, if they do have a contractual relationship with all of these people that says you shall not do that, they're welcome to go around with sniffers, find unauthorized uh, users, and either tell them to shut down or charge them extra in accordance with the contract. 
What they can't do is interfere with the wireless signal. Yeah. Okay. Now, there's where I need to bring in my legal experts here because, uh, again, I think Marriott, it was horrible for doing this. And I would probably do the whole IT vigilante thing if my convention center was trying to do something like that to me. But I, I want to point something out here. We're all talking about interference. And yes, jamming, in any sense of the term, jamming the FCC could come down hard on you because you are not allowed to interfere with licensed or unlicensed spectrum if it's, an, if it's going to an authorized device. However, the issue I had when we first brought up this story was Marriott's not actually jamming. They're not doing anything to the RF, and that's what the FCC has jurisdiction over. What they were doing was a deauthorization attack, which is, which is above the wireless level. So it's not, it's not playing with the RF. It's a legitimate command in, in 802.11 management frames that says deauthorize this user and reauthorize him. That's, that's actually a legitimate command. So it's not an attack. It's not a hack. It was a legitimate management request. And for me, it seems as if, and I want to throw this over to you, Denise, first. It seems as if the FCC was overstepping if it has nothing to do with RF energy. Well, it seems like Marriott should have had an expert with your kinds of knowledge <laughs> and insight to make that point to the FCC, and maybe they would have had more success. Um, lacking that, uh, I, I tend to concur with Curtis's take on this, that, you know, you have, if you have a contractual agreement with people in your space that they're going to behave in a certain way with their hotspots and they violate that agreement, that, that that's your recourse. And once you start taking steps to knock them off your network, whatever, you know, wherever at whatever layer those steps take place um you're you're crossing a line that you know is going to at least interest the fcc um right. you you may have a, a legitimate point there padre that that maybe this is uh, something that that technically wouldn't have violated section 333 of the act but uh i could still see the fcc being concerned with you know taking your uh, management strategy and uh, putting it into, you know, instead of I'm going to take legal steps against you if you violate our agreement, um, I'm going to take concrete and immediate technical steps that prevent you from using an otherwise completely authorized and legal device. Right. Uh, we've got WS8, uh, W8SS Joe in the chat room who's saying, wait, wait a minute, they were, in, they were antennas and therefore RF was involved. No, I mean, think of it this way. If if there's a radio station that's broadcasting and you start broadcasting on the same frequency and causing interference, the FCC absolutely has the right to come down on you. That is their jurisdiction. That's their right. And you are violating the terms of the usage of that spectrum. However, that's not what a deauth attack is. A deauth attack doesn't mess with the antennas. It doesn't mess with the RF energy. It would be like you walk into the radio station and you tell someone you can't go on the air. That's that's what it was. And it doesn't seem to me like the FCC should have jurisdiction over that. Uh, Evan, let me throw this over to you because this is what I, this is. I'm so conflicted here. I want the FCC to be able to do this. I would like for them to be able to go through convention centers and hotels and stop sleazy IT practices. But the, there's a part of me that says, but they're not actually doing what the FCC is saying that they're doing. Um, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> Do you find, are you with me here? It's like legal creep. I, I want them to have this power, <laughs> but I don't know if they legally should have this power. Well, I, I, probably you're overthinking it a little bit, Padre, because, you know, that's, <laughs> that what, be the brilliant, first time. that's what brilliant people do. I mean, I, I hear your, your concern here with this, uh, with, with, you know, the, with the, the, the assertion you're making that what they actually did here wouldn't fall within the scope of what's prohibited in, in within section 333. And, and to, to, to address this, I think if we look at the actual text of Section uh, 333, we do something that, that courts do. And when they're reading a statute and, and interpreting it and seeing how it should apply, you start uh, one of the, the things that you have as a premise is that no language in the statute is going to be superfluous, that the, that the legislature put every word there for a reason and that you can't just read out some terms as being uh, not not relevant to the analysis. And what Section 333 says is no person shall willfully... Uh, or maliciously, uh, you're prohibited from doing two things, interfere with mm. a radio communication or cause interference. 
Now, to the to the the untrained ear, those sound like the same thing, right? Interfere with or cause interference. What's what's the real difference? And so, I would suggest that what you're talking about is uh, not causing interference. It's interfering but that with. It is interfering with. I would say that interfering, if we want to make a Venn diagram about it, you know, those, the set of things that would constitute interfering with is a bigger set than the smaller set of those things, which would constitute causing interference. And so I think that we can just sort of, you know, cut the Gordian knot here by saying, sure, the FCC was fine within section 333 to, to do this uh, with the, the plain text of the way it is. We don't have to get all, uh, you know, bizarre about it. And folks, that's why we have Twill. Uh, Evan, I know you have a hard out, so I, I would like to give you a chance to say goodbye to, to the Twyatt Riot, to tell them what you're doing and what you're up to. We're going to be coming right back. We, we've got one more story that I really want Denise to take a look at. But, uh, uh, Evan, it is always an honor and a privilege to speak with you. If uh, if you could tell us where we can find you, find you, your work, and your firm. The privilege is all mine, Padre. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And actually, I have uh, I have stepped away from from Twill. It's been about a, a you know six weeks or so now. So Denise is the only one that's the boss over at <laughs> Twill now. Um, I uh, am now with a firm called Much Shellist in Chicago. I'm a, a partner in the technology and intellectual property group. I work very closely with our firms, uh, corporate and finance uh, groups, dealing with uh, incredibly innovative companies, emerging companies, new media uh, technology developers, purveyors of, of technology. So things are going great here in Chicago, having, having a great time. So I've uh, really enjoyed speaking with uh, with the audience. And Denise, I'm looking forward to getting back uh, to Twill, you know, as a guest. Hopefully, if you would uh, do me the honor of, of, uh, of having me back on. So uh, yeah, everybody Absolutely. follow me on internet. Follow me on internet cases at, at internet cases on Twitter. My blog is internetcases.com. So it's uh, it's been awesome talking with you all. So thank you very much. It's always great good to see you. you Evan. Yeah, you right take on. care. See you later. All right, when we come back, let's talk a little bit about dirt boxes. But before that, let's go ahead and take a break and talk about the sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Now, in this day and age, when we talk about advanced communications methods, we normally focus on the latest in social. And it's, you know, that's not really what you need if you're running an enterprise. Because the tech that we use in the enterprise gets more and more reliable with every generation, and we need a way to find out what that technology is doing. Servers fail over, switches route around outages, and storage has redundancies for redundancies. But no matter how sophisticated those tools become, those things will still break when you least expect them to. And only the latest in alerting technology will help you. When it impacts your customers, you want to be woken from your deep sleep. And that's why we're happy to have PagerDuty as part of the Twilight Riot. Now, if you rely on your software and services to always be up, PagerDuty is an essential tool. As the hub of your operations, PagerDuty connect connects all of your systems into a single view where you can see the critical events across all of your monitoring tools. There are over 100 ready-to-use integrations, including Nagios, New Relic, Keynote, App Dynamics, or you could roll your own with PagerDuty's APIs. Now, here's how it works. When an incident occurs, PagerDuty first filters and deduplicates events to ensure that only actionable alerts are delivered. This is a vital step that so many other solutions miss because if it just raises the noise floor, all you do is you get engineers who think that it's a false alarm. Now, after decreasing the noise, it notifies the right team and members based on call schedules and personalized alerting preferences. If alerts are missed, PagerDuty will automatically escalate the issue to another team member until it's responded to. Alerts are dispatched by automated phone calls, SMS, email, push not notifications, essentially any communication method that you have, and it's fully distributed across multiple data centers and multiple hosting providers with multiple contact methods so that you know you'll never miss an alert. Now, what does all this mean? It means that you can easily resolve incidents on the go so that you can live your life even when you're on call. PagerDuty's analytic tools will also identify common problems, allowing you to proactively make system improvements and to prevent future outages. And you can customize it to fit how you and your team work, regardless of your location or size. PagerDuty is trusted by thousands of companies, including Microsoft, GitHub, Boeing, Nike, Pinterest, and Box, and we want you to trust them too. Now, get the right engineer on the right problem at the right time with PagerDuty. Visit pagerduty.com slash twit to sign up for a free 14-day trial. And for as little as $19 a month, you can increase your uptime with PagerDuty. 
When you sign up, you'll be entered for a chance to win a PagerDuty exclusive on-call survival kit. That's pagerduty.com slash twit. pagerduty.com slash twit. And we thank PagerDuty for their support of this week in Enterprise Tech. Now let's get back to the action. Denise, we had fun last week talking about dirt boxes. And of course, we're talking about these airborne stingers that the DOJ have been using to perform man-in-the-middle attacks on all phones within range. Now, again, for our audience at home, the way it, a stinger works is you would put it on the side of a building or an antenna mast, and your cell phone will automatically attach to the strongest signal it can. If that happens to be the stinger, then your data will go through the stinger and then from the stinger to a valid cell phone tower. Now, the problem with that is because the encryption happens between the phone and what it thought was a tower, whoever's running the stinger will get all of your information, including the call, the call number, any data that you may have been passing through the connection, unencrypted. They've been putting these stingers, and they're calling them dirt boxes now, into Cessna aircraft that they fly over populated areas so that they can intercept the calls of everyone in that region. At minimum, that gives them the IMEI numbers, the unique identifying numbers of any cell phones that are within its range. Now, if they connect to someone who they're not looking for, they say they let that call go, but they still keep the IMEI number. If they have a suspect that they have a warrant for, then they can actually listen into the call. Denise, have you covered this all at all on Twill? No, we, I haven't covered it yet on Twill, and, and it's a really interesting story that uh, I, I find it really interesting from the standpoint of someone who's watched, you know, sort of the cat and mouse of um, what the law provides and what people do with technology, but this kind of flips it on its head, and now it's the government getting very creative with how uh, technology enables them to gather information. And now the question is, is, is the law going to say that that's, that's an okay uh, development? And I think that's still an open question that you raised some really good points about um, the Fourth Amendment and reasonable expectations of privacy and uh, when a warrant is required. And, uh, you know, I think that it, it, certainly looking at any information that was gathered this way without a warrant would would be an easy Fourth Amendment question. Um, what you're getting into is more of sort of an NSA type scenario of we're developing a large database and uh, we will, you know, search it within the bounds of the law. The, so the question is the, re the legality of the database itself and, and I do think that that's something that um, will be challenged, and I don't know how it will come out. Uh, I will unleash the Chebert here because I think mm -hmm. the Chebert has some bottled rage that's coming up. Chebert, when we talked about this, you had issues because it it appeared from the progression of stories that we've covered on Twyatt that this was just a, a loophole that the DOJ was driving a Cessna through in order to get around <laughs> the suppression of metadata in several high-profile cases where they were told, no, 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 a warrant for a person's information does not necessarily give you the, uh, the right to obtain their metadata from a third-party provider, a cell phone. It sounded like the DOJ was saying, well, fine, we'll just collect it ourselves. Yeah, and um, I actually compared it to those um, Cal, Cal transportation passes, you know, for bridges and toll roads mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, when something is sent out into the air, is, is it still considered private? I think that's the basis of my argument. And um, so if they're only collecting IMEI information, eh, I'm, I'm kind of not too terribly upset about that. So you're, you're, okay, you're okay with the metadata. If they, I mean, if, they no. have, if they have a date stamp that this IMEI was in this area at this time on this date, that seems fair game because that's being broadcast right. out into the air. But yeah, then... but I have a problem with the man in the middle. Okay, tell you know, me. When they're actually starting when they're, especially when they're grabbing more. When you've gone into something as active as a man in the middle attack, where you're setting up the uh, encryption keys uh, for the conversation between the stinger and the cell phone, 
and then forwarding it on, one, you're now, you know, breaking in, you're actively opening up the communication. And in my mind, that should require a warrant. Mm. Right. It's the, it's the uh, breaking of the encryption in a way that does not conform with people's expectations of how encryption is going to go and to what extent their data is going to travel encrypted. Exactly. Right. As you say, it's the man in the middle of attack. I'm curious what you guys think. I saw um, a write-up the other day of something called the black phone. <laughs> yes. And I'm wondering if that would... Uh, would protect you from this kind of man in the middle of attack from their literature. It says they're upping their encryption several layers above normal, but I don't know if that would necessarily do the trick. There, there's one thing on the black phone that would work. The black mm -hmm. phone can offer true end to end. So the problem with a standard cell phone is it's encrypted, but it's encrypted to the tower. So between the phone and the tower, you have encryption. So someone just listening into the, the conversation won't be able to, to make anything out of it. But if the tower is owned, if the tower is being used to attack you, then there is no encryption past that tower. So they have the unencrypted data. What the black phone can do is they actually have a service that will do what's called end-to-end. -end. It will go from the phone to a secure server on the other side and everything in between is encrypted. So even if there's a stinger, it won't be, it will be able to decrypt the basic uh, GSM encryption, but it will not be able to break the added layer of black phone encryption. Uh, mm -hmm. So that would help. And there's, there's many privacy experts who are saying that's really the only way that's going to, it's going to work. But then the problem becomes now, do you trust the endpoint? Is, can, can you trust that the endpoint is actually not taking your unencrypted data and, and doing something with it that would allow someone else to spoof it? Uh, let me let me go to you, Curtis, before we, we wrap up. We, we talked a little bit about this on Twite, this idea of when you broadcast your data out into the air, if you don't understand the issues that are inherent in doing that, that, that will violate your privacy, then you really can't complain. Do, do we still hold on to those, those uh, beliefs? Well, yes and no, because on the one hand, any responsible professional, and let, let's assume that in the enterprise world, we are talking largely about professionals, at, at least among the group that's going to be setting policy and making decisions about uh, preferred use. Those people should have an absolutely clear understanding of what's possible out there, what is likely and what is acceptable for their particular set of enterprise data. When it comes to individual users, though, we've long since passed the point at which most people have the time and resources to fully understand all the issues. And that's why you have things like the reasonable man standard. You know, is would a reasonable person be uh, in a position to consider this uh, a private conversation? If the answer is yes, then that's the standard that has typically been applied. Um, one of the things that we are seeing, and I, I have heard a number of legal scholars talk about this, is that the, the notion of what is reasonable um, is changing over time. Uh, but right now, I still think that most people assume that because it is illegal for casual users to intercept cell phone transmissions, mm -hmm. that what they say on their phones is private. And barring a specific legal instrument like a warrant that allows law enforcement to listen, I think that's an expectation that should be honored by all levels of government. Well, on that note, I'm afraid we're going to have to call this episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech. This this has been a lot of fun. We, uh, and again, we're going to do this again. We're going to have another legal extravaganza because, you know, I think without a legal professional in the conversation every once in a while, we, I, especially I, let my speculation run wild. It's always nice to have the voice of reason. I, I want to thank you, Denise, and of course, Evan, for being our voice of reason, for coming on This Week in Enterprise Tech, especially right after doing Twill. Uh, could you please tell the members of the Twilight Right where they can find you, find your show, and uh, find what you're doing throughout the week? Uh, well, you can find the show at twit.tv slash twill. 
Uh, you can find me on Twitter. I'm D Howell there. And, uh, the, the show has a Facebook and uh, Google Plus page, and we'd love it if you'd uh, jump in there if uh, you enjoy more of conversations about the legal aspects of technology, because uh, that's what we do every week on Twill, and uh, we love doing it. Uh, we're going to be dark next week for Thanksgiving, but uh, the week after that, we're going to do an all drone law show. So um, I know that uh, you're into drones, Padre. I'm assuming uh, your listeners are at least um, personally interested th in them and potentially uh, professionally interested in them as well, since they are um, becoming such a part of the way people would like to do business. But uh, it's becoming difficult to figure out exactly how you can incorporate them and uh, use them legally. So we're going to talk about that. And uh, we just love uh, talking about this sort of stuff. So yeah, I'd love to come back on whenever you'd like. One of the smartest shows on the internet, folks. You got to check out This Week in Law. Denise Howell, again, we'll have you back. So good to see you. And I'll be watching your drone special. Thank you. I also want to thank my co-host, starting with Mr. Curtis Franklin. Curtis, what's going on at Enterprise at Information Week Radio? Padre, we're heading towards the end of the year with our, uh, our series, uh, This Information Week. Uh, that's going to continue right up through the end of the year and beyond as we look at uh, what's happening on informationweek.com <coughs> every week. We've got Information Week universities going on. Uh, these are opportunities to learn about things like the, the ways to do contracts in cloud computing and get the best results. We've got something new starting early in December. Check out uh, iTunes for Interop Radio, a weekly series of programs from the InteropNet and from the conference leading up to Interop Las Vegas at the end of April 2015. Thank you, Curtis. It's always a pleasure to speak with you each and every single week. And of course, the other member of the Twyat Trinity, Mr. Brian Chi. I want to thank the Geek in Paradise for being here. Can you please tell the Twyat Riot what you're up to and what you'll be doing in the next week? Well, first off, Oh, that's very cute. <laughs> I uh, finally got my Microsoft band. I'm still frozen. Apparently, Skype does not have enough bandwidth. I only have, on a scale of six bars, I only have two bars for bandwidth. Anyway, I'm going to be playing over at our harbor facility and working on building a new fiber optic infrastructure to support a multi-million dollar ROV that actually belongs to the University of Hawaii instead of us having to rent it for 30 grand a day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, t -Bert. Gentlemen, it is fantastic to have you on. It is a pleasure each and every single week to be with you to talk about enterprise tech. It's also a pleasure to be with you. That's right, our loyal viewer, the person who downloads each and every single episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech so that you can enjoy it at your leisure. And you know what? We want to make it easier for you to do that. Go ahead and go over to our show page at twit.tv slash twiet. There you'll find our show page with all of our episodes, notes, guests, etc., etc. If you've ever had a question about an episode, just jump on in. And it also gives you a place where you can subscribe to get your episodes automatically into your device of choice. That's one of the things that we do because, you know, we, we love you. Also, don't forget that you can find our show live each and every single week at live.twit.tv, 2.30 p.m. Pacific on Mondays. If you watch the live stream, you'll see the setup, the actual show, and the post show, so you see how the sausage is made, including all the bloopers that get taken out of the final run. And as long as you're watching us live, why not jump into our chat room at irc.twit.tv? There you'll be able to jump in and speak to us during the show. I take questions out of the chat room all the time. And uh, it's, it's great to, to interact with the other members of the Twit TV Army. Uh, I also want to thank everyone here who makes this show possible. Of course, to Lisa and to Leo, to Carson, my super producer. But of course, my TD, my, uh, my very, very good friend, Mr. Cranky Hippo, Brian Burnett. Brian, could you please tell the folks where they might be able to find you throughout the week? Uh, uh, you can find me uh, doing know-how with you, and if you're wondering why I'm standing over here... Oh, wait. Wait for it. There we go. <laughs> so we've been messing around with the drones. We were talking about that earlier today, but uh, this is the one I've customized. And uh, if you want to... 
get one of these for someone for Christmas and you want to modify it, make it way better, check out Know How on Thursdays with me and Padre, and uh, we'll have some fun. We're Back o- to you. We're always having fun. Until next time, I'm Father Robert Ballas here, reminding you that if you want to know what's going on in the Enterprise, just keep quiet. Thank you.